Welcome to Camera Ready and Able, the podcast that explores the intersection of media change and personal growth. I'm your host, Barbara Barna Abel, and my calling is to help you tap into your superpowers to thrive on camera and in life, and to make an impact on the world. This episode is brought to you by the phrase, how to land your dream job. It's a rebroadcast of my episode with Elizabeth Wagmeister and was originally titled Resilient because Elizabeth rightly believes being resilient is a key to success. If you don't know Elizabeth, and you really should, she is an award-winning multimedia journalist and a member of Forbes Magazine's 30 Under 30 Class of 2019. When we recorded this episode, she was the senior correspondent at Variety and is now the Los Angeles-based correspondent for CNN covering entertainment. And so no matter what your dream job is, Elizabeth beautifully walks you through the best practices, strategies, and steps to get it, which is why I'm happy to share this episode again with a new title. Welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you, Barbara. I am so excited to be here today. And by the way, you have the best name for a podcast ever. Talk about a play on words. It's like you were meant to be born into your name. I have been waiting for this moment for so long, ever since I had an inkling that I was going to do a podcast. I was like, I can't wait to get Elizabeth on. So relevant to resilient, and I really want to talk about a lot of this today. You and I have talked about this many times in the past, and I'm constantly impressed because at your age, I was just starting out in my career. I was just really kind of starting to find my feet and discover who I was. And here you are so accomplished at such a young age. And this is where I actually want to give a shout out to Jane and Gary Wagmeister, your parents, whom I love and adore, who really do need to write a parenting book. (laughs) Well, this is what I want to get at is one of the core principles of being a resilient person is cultivating a belief in your ability to cope. So I want to start at the beginning because I do know some of these stories that I'm going to prompt you through, but can you talk to me about how you learned to cope as a young girl and when you got into dance and how hard you worked and you take it away because I'm not going to tell your story. Sure. So I think it's funny that you brought up my parents because I really had the most amazing examples and role models, which I am so lucky to have had. Not everybody has that, but I think Part of it is it was just instilled in me, certainly from my mom. Uh, My mom is the hardest working person I know. She has her doctorate degree. Um, She's in education. So for your listeners who don't know, I'm the only person in my family who's in entertainment or a creative field whatsoever. A lot of people, they hear that I'm born and raised in LA and they assume I had an in. I had no in at all. Um, I started from the ground up and then some, but I did have the advantage of obviously having a great education and having a great support system. And I think that my, uh, which by the way, I'm very privileged and grateful for all of that. Um, But I believe just because my mom really instilled in me, like women can do anything and everything. It was never even a conversation that was that blunt because it's just the household in which I was raised that, you know, there was never a conversation of women versus men and careers and this and that. And the town that I grew up in um, was actually a very affluent suburb. And a lot of the moms did not work. And my mom did work. And I think that was such a great example for me, because, you know, my a lot of my friends got picked up from school in their parents fancy cars, and the mom was there. And my mom wasn't, but that was fine, because my mom was there just you know, after work, we had dinner together every night and we talked about our days. But I think it was a great example to wake up every morning and know that my mom was leaving for work at 7 a.m. and had this huge career. So um, you mentioned dance. I was a dancer for my whole childhood. It was my sport that I played. And I started at three years old. And obviously, dance is a competitive sport. And I guess my first time that I was kind of tested (laughs) and uh, had to show off my resilience was at a very young age because I really wanted to make the dance team. And I didn't. And I actually don't remember how many times I tried out and didn't make it. That's a question for Jane. But it was a lot. Like, this wasn't like I tried out once and then made it the next year. It was a lot. And I lived and breathed this dance studio. And I just loved it so much. And my goal and dream was just to make the competitive dance team. 
And I kept trying, trying, trying and kept asking for feedback and what I could do better. And I really just, I loved it. Um, It was fun for me, but it was something that I worked really hard at. And then eventually I made the dance team and became a nationally ranked dancer. And I believe that everything happens for a reason because to your point, you know, that's something that did kind of teach me to be resilient, even though I didn't realize at the time. But now looking back, I realize being told no, um, and that's pretty hard, right? Like you're walk, it's a sent- it is an audition, right? Like you're walking into a room as a little kid and being told that you're not good enough, essentially. Uh, and I didn't take that as a diss or a bad thing. I said, okay, let me work better because I know I can do this. So, and then I believe I got not just that attribute of being resilient, but I learned a lot that has actually transpired into my career today because I always was on a stage and always performing. And I believe that having that stage presence taught me to have no fear of public speaking. Um, I used to like get up on stage. I was class president in eighth grade and like spoke at graduation. Like I always loved public speaking. And now as a broadcaster, people ask me, are you nervous on camera? And I'm like, oh, please. Like I had to dance on stage as a, you know, as a five-year-old in front of everyone. Like talking to a camera, not even seeing people in the audience is a piece of cake. What motivated you? Because most of us, after the first time we don't make the team, that's it. Do you remember any kind of internal dialogue when you were little? It's a real, I think I just always believed in myself. I think that I knew that I wasn't going to take someone's no and make that be the final answer. Uh, I don't think that I consciously thought of this as an eight-year-old, but now thinking of it, it just is me to my core, which is why would I let someone else dictate my future and my life? Like, you're going to tell me no, but I know I can do it. I'm not saying that your no was un- unwarranted. Um, I'm very open to constructive criticism. I am someone that I always want to work on my growth, whether it's personal or professional. And I, so I love getting constructive criticism. So I think when I heard the no on a, you know, from a dance instructor, I wasn't, I, of course I was upset. I was, I cried and screamed, but I took that energy and those emotions and I said, okay, well, why did I get the no? What can I learn? How can I become better at my craft? And I know I can do this. Um, and I think kind of looking now as an adult, it is, uh, it is a part of my character, which is don't let, you know, if, if I listen to everyone say no, I wouldn't be anywhere with my career because in this industry, in many industries, but certainly this industry in entertainment, you are told no much more than you are told yes. And um, you just always have to hold on to that belief that, you know, if you keep working hard and you hold on to good relationships and you treat people with kindness, all those things are important, plus a little bit of luck, a lot of bit of luck, then, you know, all those no's eventually will be the yes that matters. I want to get to the creating opportunity through maintaining relationships. But I do want to drive home something you just said, because in my life too, I was told many, many years ago, I couldn't succeed because I had no family in the industry, right? Mm -hmm. Coming as a total Mm -hmm. exciter, it won't work. And I was having an informational interview with a young woman yesterday who wants to be a comedy writer. And she was saying the same thing. And I said, statistically, no one can succeed in this business. So even though I do work with a lot of startups and people in tech, we're all about (laughs) metrics and data. I'm like, that's data you just have to throw out, right? Because theoretically, none of us can make it. So part of it is, and I've quoted this before on the podcast, I love this. No one ever failed in Hollywood. They just quit too soon. I've never heard that. I love that. Yeah, this is an impossible, impossible industry. And you have to be very resilient to bring it back to that word. And you really have to love what you do. And you have to believe in yourself. And you have to surround yourself with a support team, not just professionally, but personally. And I think that that is what keeps you motivated and can keep you pulling through. And I know we are both people who are all about women supporting other women. And that is beyond necessary in this industry because statistically you are right <laughs> no one no one should be succeeding in this industry <laughs> it also makes me think of amy cuddy's famous 
TED Talk. And a lot of people quote and say, fake it till you make it. But what she says, which resonates so much with me, is fake it until you believe it. Oh, I, I love that. And you you had that belief. And I think that there's a little bit of Jane and Gary in there, um, which is very definitely important and also special. But that is part of the thing is, is to keep, keep on keeping on. And eventually you will internalize this feeling, which is so important. Mm-hmm. But let's go back to relationship building because you're amazing mm-hmm. at this. And I do also want to go back to something you just said a second ago. I, that is such an important attribute to ask for feedback and then to accept feedback. I've had people ask for feedback and then argue with me about the feedback. And I'm like, that's not a winning tactic. That's a, to get that, take that one out of the playbook. Before we move on to relationship building, I just wanted to say that kind of a quote that I live by that I think I made up at some point in my life is that you have to work really, really hard to get lucky. And I really believe in that because this, trust me, this industry is so so much of it is based on luck. And I know that I have been lucky that I just happened to be right place, right time when I was cast in a few things, but I never would have even gotten to that place where I could have had luck brought to me if I hadn't worked my ass off. Absolutely. And you kept saying, yes. I mean, page six wasn't easy. And we were like, get yourself to New York. And you're like, okay, I'll figure it out. That's one of the things that really impressed me because you called me during the casting process and said, I have a few questions. And I was pretty direct with the answers. And instead of saying, no, I can't do it. I remember this distinctly. You said, okay, give me a couple of days. I'll figure it out. That was the right answer. Well, first of all, in that situation, are you kidding? I was, I would have done anything. I was going to get there. Of course. I felt so grateful, but I will say that um, I do think that in the workforce, you have to remember that it's it's always your job to be the person who comes up with the solution. Like I always say, make your boss's life easier. Never let, if there's a problem, let them know there's a problem, but come with solutions. And that's going to make people want to work with you and respect you and trust that they can put any issue in your hands because there's not a day that doesn't go by with an unplanned problem that comes up, but you have to show people that you can be a problem solver and that you have ideas to have the solutions. Do you have any examples where that came up in your earlier career and it propelled you forward? Ooh, earlier. I'm like thinking of today. Um, Oh, today's good too. Okay. This is like the smallest example ever, but this is something on a day to day. So I right now am Variety's lead reporter on both the Britney Spears conservatorship case and the Harvey Weinstein case because Harvey Weinstein just got extradited to Los Angeles from New York. So there's a lot going on. We also just launched our new series called The Take, shameless plug, but every Friday it comes out on Variety.com and on Vizio Smartcast TVs. (laughs) I can't believe I just did that. I'm embarrassed for myself. Uh, But point being... (laughs) There's a lot going on, right? Like I'm filming a show. I'm going on air to be an expert. I have to be at court for two different cases. And I just simply could not be at court um, for a hearing the other day, like two days ago. And um, since I knew I couldn't be there, instead of kind of just like, you know, I think some people might have said, oh, you know, I'm just not going to tell the team. And like the day of, I was just like, oh, I can't be there. Someone else has to figure it out. I said, no, I'm going to get in front of the problem. So I called our legal editor, told him that I wouldn't be able to be there. Um, we figured out a solution. Like he went, but I pre-wrote the entire story because I know it's, I'm the lead person on this story. So I sent essentially a story that was already written um and we just came up with a way that we could kind of like teamwork and tag team and make it happen and i think that getting ahead of the problem was the right thing to do rather than you know wait like i'm not the boss i'm not the head of the department but i just think ahead and i don't think it's for my boss to ask me you know what's on the calendar and can you go if i know i can't go i'm going to tell him in advance and come with a solution and our coverage was great and it, it all worked out. So that's like a very small example. But these are things when you're a journalist and a reporter comes up all the time. You know, there'll be a breaking story and suddenly you can't meet a deadline. And instead of freaking out or trying to kind of dance around the problem, you have to come up with a solution and present it to your editor and to your team. And that's how we build relationships 101, which is amazing because so many of these relationships have, you know, propelled you forward year after year. So I also want to talk about something you said to me 
when we had lunch just before the pandemic, one of the keys to success is being good at the job you were hired to do so that you can then go on and create opportunities from that job. And I remember what some of these were in terms of how that let you start covering red carpets when you were an assistant. And the same thing too, which I'm so genius and I learned from this, is how you started volunteering to transcribe interview tapes. And we'll explain to people what that process is and how valuable that was for you to learn how to interview as well as an incredibly valuable thing for your bosses, because that's a lot of work. Yes. Okay. So this is a good example going back to the beginning of my career. So, um, you know, you said that I said, uh, <laughs> I swear uh, it, you said it. It's a game of telephone, but I, it sounds right. Yeah. I think I said that, that, you know, always be good at the job that you were hired to do. Um, because as long as you're doing that, then everything else is just extra. Once you start failing at the job that you were hired to do, then no matter how ambitious you are and how great all the other things you do are, the only thing that will be noticed is that you didn't do the job you're hired for. So where this comes into play for my career story is my first job was as the editor, is the assistant to the editor in chief at TV Guide magazine in New York. And I had interned there the summer before and um, I, oh my gosh, I really pushed my way in there. Um, and that's another tangent. But anyway, I was like dream job being the assistant to the editor in chief. And um, I convinced them because I was on the quarter system at UC Santa Barbara, which means that I didn't graduate until mid June. And there were other candidates who could start in May. And what I did, this is the tangent, Barbara, is I was in New York for my brother's law school graduation. And I went to TV Guide because I had interned there the summer before. And I essentially told myself I wouldn't leave the lobby until they let me up. And I called my former intern boss and said I was there because I was in New York for 48 hours for my brother's graduation. And could I speak to the editor in chief, who I really hadn't met as an intern? And I um, waited hours upon hours and went into her office and gave her a hug, which like thinking about now, I'm like cringing. I'm like, oh my God, I was the intern who gave the editor a hug. Um, but I basically said, I know that there's people who could start earlier, but like, here's the reasons why you should wait a month for me. Like I have to graduate. I will be in New York. I will move myself from California. I'll be done with college. Like I will be in New York right away. And I moved five days after I graduated. But I kind of gave a pitch for why. And now we're going in this roundabout way. But speaking of relationships, that person, Deborah Birnbaum, who was the editor in chief years down the road, ended up being the executive editor at Variety and called me and hired me, which is how I ended up there. So just to show how relationships work. Anyway, the job I was hired to do was to be Deborah's assistant, which means open packages, book travel you know, book flights, um, also do editorial tasks, but really like first and foremost, do the administrative tasks that an assistant does, pick up the phones, take messages, all of that. Well, I identified it was a very small staff, you know, TV Guide is an incredible publication and I would encourage everyone to read it. Their editors are amazing, but we all know this business and small staff. Um, so I saw that clearly they could use more writers and reporters. And fun fact, to people who want to be on red carpets, it seems like a dream job. It is the most thankless job. And many seasoned editors do not want to do it. Do not want to do it. Some people love it and they're amazing. Shout out to Mark Malkin, my colleague at Variety, who is literally the best person on the red carpet in the history of red carpets. We're so lucky to have him. But he loves it. A lot of people don't. And I realized that none of the editors wanted to go to a red carpet because in their minds, they've worked all day. They want to get home to their families. They don't want to take the train home at 10 p.m. after a red carpet. And I, are you kidding? At 21, I was like, I would do anything. So I basically pitched myself to do these red carpets. But what was always top of mind for me is I have to get the administrative work done because the second that I get a call from the editor saying, where's my car? Or why did I miss this meeting? Where was my, why wasn't my calendar updated? It doesn't matter if I got the biggest scoop in the world on that carpet because I didn't do my job. So that's something that I learned very early on. Basically, if you care enough, if you're passionate enough, if you want to succeed, like you'll make the time and you'll do the extra time to fit in the other things. 
because even though it might be good work, if it's not your job, doesn't matter. And um, to elaborate on the transcribing, I also identified these editors were very busy. And when you do an interview on the phone, you record it and then you have to transcribe it after. So if you do like an hour interview, it could take five hours to transcribe, depending how fast you are at typing. And um, by the way, I don't believe in transcription services. I know a lot of people use them. Just here's a little journalist tip. I personally like to transcribe myself because you hear the tone in which the question was asked and answered, and it just helps me to write the story. So I always transcribe my own stuff. Um, but at this time, I asked the editors if I could transcribe for them because I knew it would save them hours of time. And it's how I learned to do an interview. Um, you know, people ask me a lot, like, how did you learn to write? How did you learn how to do an interview? How did you learn how to be on TV? Really just from soaking it up and from shadowing people and following people. Um, and, and that's how I learned to ask questions in interviews. I learned so much from that when you told me that. So now I teach people that and I've had other clients, um, especially on the political interview side, say they did the same thing because you, anyone could go on YouTube or any platform and go to people you admire who are at the top of their game in anything, whether it's sports, politics, finance, entertainment, and actually pause and transcribe. Because to your point, you learn so much about the nuance of asking the question, where the pauses are mm -hmm. that are really effective. And that sometimes too, the follow-up is only one word or a couple of words like, tell me more, go on. And that you don't have to over ask questions, right. which I think is a big thing that young interviewers need to learn because you want to give so much context. Yes. And I think, you know, the unedited interview is what really was a learning tool for me, because if you watch an interview, by the way, you should watch everything on TV and you should listen to podcasts and listen. Well, podcasts are great because they largely are unedited. Um, but, you know, if you watch a television interview, that, there could have been an hour sit down that's then edited down to three minutes. What I really learned from was listening to the entire hour and being able to listen to the conversation. And um, since you know, you're know you bringing up the way of asking questions with all this context, I would also share that one of the biggest tips for interviewing for journalists is silence. When you ask a question and you let the interview subject answer, if they give you a short answer, just stay silent. They will speak. If you come in with a follow-up because you don't like the answer you got, then it feels a bit defensive. They might feel a bit under the gun, like, oh, this journalist didn't like the question that I asked. So now I need to, you know, double down on answering in my trained media, you know, talking point. Whereas if you're just silent, you'll get a little scoop. Fun fact. <laughs> Of all the many things that you do and do so well, Elizabeth Wagmeister, what's your favorite? Okay. Uh, so I, I really love being on set because I love the feeling. It really is a team and it sounds cheesy, but it's like a family. Like being on a TV set is very different than being in an office. It's just fun. It's stressful as hell, <laughs> especially a daily show, which we worked on together, but it's just so fun. So I love that. I love to be with the team. I love live TV, love live TV. It's like the rush of live TV and not knowing what's coming is great. Um, that said, I am a total journalist nerd and I geek out on breaking a story and digging into stories. So, you know, the days where I'm in court, and I'm literally in the courthouse with a notepad because we're not allowed to have phones, like scribbling notes, AKA my Britney Spears story that I wrote last week. And I was one of very few journalists who was in the courtroom. Like those quotes from Britney were verbatim from my handwriting. My hand still hurts. <laughs> but point being, I say all this because journalism is not glamorous. There's glamorous parts. You know, sure, we sit in hair and makeup before we go on, on a show. But that's actually annoying. It's like, I don't have time to be in hair and makeup. So I'm sitting in hair and makeup and I'm not prepping for my segment I'm about to do. I'm actually writing the story because I have to meet a deadline. And then I'm lucky. I Instagrammed this the other day. I said, I'm excited for the new show I'm doing. You're lucky if you even have time to prep for it <laughs> you know, because you're just juggling a million things. So I, I love the Rush Alive TV. I love the collaboration of being on set, but I really love like digging in 
to a story and doing the unglamorous, nitty gritty parts of journalism, um, like an investigative story, you know, just pounding the phones for months and then being able to to break it. And um, I've been really fortunate that a lot of the stories that I've been involved with have really made impact. So this is kind of a more um, bigger picture way to answer this. But, you know, doing the Matt Lauer story or the Harvey Weinstein trial, then you see that the work of all journalists, um, because of the bravery of sources and women um, who have been subject to this terrible behavior, we really are seeing impact. And it was kind of the first time in my job where my career, where I noticed that my job could have impact. Um, it's all part of a cycle. You know, journalists are one piece of this cycle towards a safer environment in the workforce. But that was pretty amazing. That's when I felt like, okay, I'm not just, you know, doing fun work that entertains people, which is very important, but I'm actually doing work that I feel good about, even though it's hard. I want to thank you so much for the work you did covering Harvey Weinstein's trial, because your sensitivity around telling each one of those victim stories was really powerful. And I read every single one. Thank you. Well, I, I really mean this. It sounds cheesy, but the coverage wouldn't be possible without those women. And I'm actually, as we speak, I'm working on another story since Harvey is in LA now um, and facing a new trial. So yeah, those are every time I get on the phone with one of those women, I feel really, really grateful that um, we, I actually just spoke to one of them the other day and we were saying, you know, it's interesting because I'm a journalist, I'm unbiased, they're an interview subject. But facts are facts. When someone is convicted of rape, like that's no longer bias, that's a fact. And those things wouldn't have happened without sources and people speaking out and the journalists covering it and, you know, the prosecutors who were brave enough to bring that trial forth. So that's a an ongoing story, but um, something that definitely I never thought that I would do. And that's a, a big career moment because I feel like hopefully I've made some sort of a difference. Well, it's about tireless work. And I want to actually circle this now back again to the notion of you are resilient because I use this example all the time. It's in my book. It's in my class. I think I've blogged about this. It's one of my favorite examples and you probably just do it. You're not even aware, but again, working on page six TV with you, I was flabbergasted and completely impressed watching you cover like the Oscars red carpet on a Sunday night like all dolled up, do the, do the, doing the do, hopping on a red eye, landing at JFK, God knows what, like changing in the bathroom at the airport. I don't know, but here's the whole thing. Fresh as a daisy showing up on set at what, 7 a.m. or whenever that was at page six TV. And I was like, wow. And I use this as an example because I tell people, if you can go away on vacation for a week and just party your mind out, like get no sleep, and then take a red eye back and go straight to the office and look fabulous and just knock it out. You can maybe do Elizabeth's job. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So I will say it was the bathroom on the airplane. <laughs> and I will say I got really good at what I would call my in-flight facials, <laughs> which by the way, was a Neutrogena makeup wipe <laughs> and some rose spray, some spritz. And uh, I, okay, so I would go from the Oscars red carpet and I would have a full face of makeup. And by the way, I have to give a shout out to my dear friend, Zamir Kassam, who is a jeweler and always loans me jewels for award shows. And I probably shouldn't say this because I don't want to get kidnapped. But one time I was wearing a $2 million diamond necklace under my hoodie on the plane. I said, where is security, Zamir? He's like, it's insured. It's fine. I'm like, okay. I'm sleeping like this on the plane. So anyway, fun fact. Um, but of course, I won't do that again, because now that I've said that, I might, you know, be held for ransom. But anyway, so full face of makeup. And then I would get on the plane and I would literally like sit on the plane and get my glass of red wine, because that was my one thing that I had to do. To, I don't take sleeping pills. Like I don't take melatonin. I won't wake up in the morning. So one glass of red wine for me works. And I go to bed on a red eye. 
Um, so I would do my Neutrogena makeup wipe and then take off my eyelashes and then spritz my whatever and then put on my moisturizer and put on my mask and go to sleep for four hours, hopefully. And then I would land and I would go straight from the airport to set and there we were. But here's the thing. I, it's a funny story to me. Like it's funny to say, but I don't think it's impressive because I'm like, I am so grateful right now. No, I'm so grateful. Like I'm on the Oscars red carpet covering for Variety, the top most trusted brand and entertainment. And then I'm getting on a plane to go cross country from LA to New York to co-host a nationally syndicated show, Page Six TV. Like, of co- are you kidding? Like, of course I'm going to go straight from set and not complain about the sleep. Like I sleep a few hours, three, four hours on the flight. And then I come home. And by the way, those days are the craziest because it's post Oscars. So I usually would have a hit on Good Day New York and then I would do page six and then I would go to Wendy Williams and then I would go on Fox Business. And it's like, you're everywhere. But to me, I'm like, this is what I've worked so hard for. And this is what I love to do. Those are the fun days. Like those are the fun, fun, fun days. And then I go to bed by maybe not Monday, but hopefully Tuesday and sleep just for, you know, 12 hours. And then I'm good. Wait, can we sidebar? What's the future of the award show now? Oh, gosh. Okay. So I think award shows, here to stay. Ratings are tanking, but it's still an award show. People want them. The industry wants them. If anything, there's so many egos in this business that, you know, everyone needs to get an award. So those will continue. You know, the networks will continue to pay the rights to get their praise. Um, But I think those red carpets are here to stay. Like the Oscar red carpet... One day, by the way, the Oscar red carpets will have higher viewership than the actual Oscars. Mark my words. Like, that's not so far off. Uh, But I do think the future of the red carpet is a question mark because we have seen that these studios and these networks can get great coverage without sending talent across the country, you know, to do a junket in London and then a junket in New York and then a junket in LA and then do a red carpet in Tokyo. And, you know, I think it's very important to promote, but I think there'll be less of it. So I don't think the red carpet's going away, but I think when you could just hop on Zoom for free, like no hotels, no flights, no food for talent, it's a big, big money saver. So I think we will see less red carpets because in LA and New York, you have, you know, 20 red carpets a week for a product launch. Like, you know, people go to the opening of an envelope for like a, a mm. moisturizer. <laughs> That's not happening anymore. On that fabulous note, where can everyone find you and follow you? Everyone can find me at, well, all my social handles are at eWagmeister. So that is my Twitter and my Instagram and my Facebook And then you can find my work at Variety. So we are a weekly magazine that comes out and we have very good paper. Our magazine is, I mean, it's a beautiful magazine. Also variety.com and our new show that just launched is called Variety The Take. It launches every Friday at 9 a.m. on all Variety's platforms. Oh, j'adore you. And I want to thank you for listening to this episode of Camera Ready and Able. Your support and feedback means the world. If you would like information on private coaching or workshops for your organization or small group classes, please shoot me an email via my website, ableintermedia.com. And please be sure to hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. Thank you. Thank you.